Alan Darby, Jacqueline Martinez. This is the Buyer's Boardroom. Learn the most about who you are today and where you want to be after. Welcome back to the Buyer's Boardroom. So excited to be here today. How are you doing, Alan? I'm doing great. Doing great as always. Good to be here with you. Looking forward to this one. This is going to be a fun episode, I think. I know. A little for, bit for me, spicy. Yeah. Kind of a controversial position to take. Of course, Alaris, we are M&A advisors, sell site advisors in the wealth management space. Just kind of want to explore that, the historical ways that our competitors on the sell side have operated, talking a bit more about how Alaris takes a different approach and kind of putting it up on the docket for deciding, you know, what way is best, what are the pros and cons of each. And, you know, ultimately when clients engage us or another firm, they're looking for different things and that and that's okay. But wanting to be clear about how we approach things different and and why. And I think a lot of it really is our background from United Capital days, you know, kind of a old name at this point, but I was in-house M&A and you were exclusively bringing firms to United Capital. So we were very dedicated to it, really saw the outcomes of when there was a great partnership and we were definitely aligned on all the important things and the rare situations where someone slipped through that wasn't really aligned and how disruptive that can be to the culture. Well, you know, one Today is a little bit different episode for us. You know, it's a buyer's boardroom. So historically, we're either interviewing buyers predominantly, occasionally a seller that's come through the process and getting their take on different things. But today, we're not actually interviewing someone. It's just going to be you and I. But we thought it was worthwhile to explore this because, frankly, I and you agree, I think, that the legacy, let's call it pathway to partnership. Uh, and we're not talking about doing it yourself. Like, so advisors who seek to engage directly with buyers one-on-one -on -one in a solo capacity, this is not what we're talking about. <clears throat> we're actually talking about hiring a sell side advisor to represent you, which we obviously, in our business, we think that's the preferred route for a number of reasons. But without getting into those today, what does the advisor do? Now, how do they go about identifying and matching you with prospective buyers? And so that's what we're talking about today. And the legacy pathway that sell side advisors have used is what's generally referred to as an auction, an auction process. And we're going to unpack that a lot today. Specifically, it's a financial auction. And as you know, at Alaris, we don't do financial auctions, but we think it, it's worth time exploring like what is a financial auction? What's it designed to do? Where those are quite honestly applicable, you know, where they're maybe even preferred and where they're not. And so that's sort of the point to today. And it's all rooted in my belief that financial auctions are simply inappropriate for wealth management businesses. And what I mean by that is, you know, auctions, think about whether it's an online auction, like an eBay or an auction that you might go to with the people who are doing the auctioneers and, you know, what are they doing? It's a mechanism for a, an owner of an asset to divest the asset, right? I mean, that's, that's what an auction is. You're, you're selling an asset. And the highest price wins. The highest price wins. Yeah. It's, that's exactly what it's designed to do. And we'll talk about that. But the question I'm posing is, is it the best mechanism to divest this sort of asset that we're dealing with? in wealth management, because the reality is it's not a car. It's not a piece of real estate. The asset that we're disposing of, and that's not even reality, because as you and I know, the vast majority, I would put it at maybe 90% or higher of sellers who are selling their RIA or the wealth management business are not disposing the asset. You know, they're, they may be monetizing it or de-risking it a bit, but they're not leaving as a result of the transaction. Right, they're not walking away. Exactly. And so you have to look at it as, does the financial pro auction process, which again, we're gonna unpack, is that the best vehicle to serve all of the stakeholders that are involved here, okay? And most people, when they talk about the stakeholders, they usually reference either the buyer or the seller, meaning the owner. Just the owner, right? The owners are like the stakeholders that are, 
being considered here. And I disagree with that. And I know you do too. It's the stakeholders include the buyer and the seller. Perhaps those are um, amongst the most important, if not the most important, but you also have other stakeholders involved. You have the team of the seller, the team of the buyer. You have clients of the seller. You know, these are all very important stakeholders in this process. And I know, as you do, like when we talk to sellers all the time, they're hyper concerned about their team and their clients. I mean, it's like at the forefront and the majority of interactions we're involved in is ensuring that those two stakeholders are taken care of. And so we're asking the question, does the financial auction address those stakeholders? And, and I'll get to the punchline. It does not. It does not. And so we're going to talk about that today. Yep. That'll be great. I'd love for you to share too. You were telling me um, prior to this, some of the research you've done just generally on financial auctions and one term specifically, the winner's curse. Unbeknownst to me, there's a volume of work done on the psychology of auctions and how they're purposefully structured to really play on uh, human emotion you know, psychological drivers, if you will. <clears throat> Again, the auction process, it's, insofar as I can infer, its sole value proposition is to extract the maximum amount of valuation on the transaction itself. You know, there's no consideration for anything post that initial valuation. Okay, so keep that in mind as we're going to talk. There's a whole lot of other considerations in a wealth management sale beyond the initial valuation or consideration paid for the asset. But so the winner's curse, as you said, that's, that's something that's like a term of art in the auction industry where a buyer having been subjected to these psychological, you know, points that the auction is designed to do and is victorious in acquiring the asset ultimately has buyer's remorse. Because after contemplating and realizing that, you know, not that they've been duped, but they've let their emotion get in the way of rational judgment, leading them to overpay for something that doesn't meet their post-acquisition needs. <clears throat> so, you know, there, there's several things that go into, like I'll give you some examples of the, the types of psychological things that the auction are designed to, to play on. So there's this notion called social proof, okay? Basically, social proof is that if you're participating as a buyer in an auction, the sheer fact that there are other participants in the auction socially establishes in your mind that this asset must have value. When in fact, you know, the, the existence of other bidders has no direct bearing on the value of the asset being disposed of. But that social feeling that, hey, other people are bidding on it must be worth something. You know, all these type A's that we work with, everyone wants to win. Absolutely. That's, that's a, it's a very real thing. Time pressure. You know, the belief that there's only so much time we have to act and acquire this asset. So that feeling that, you know, I'm running out of time mentally will, you know, influence someone to make unrational decisions, right? Scarcity is another issue that's embedded in these financial or just auctions, period, where the, it's the belief that, you know, there's not going to be another one like this, or is, you know, it's running out. This, this type of asset, this quality of this asset is not going to be there in the future. And so, you know, th those are just three examples of psychology that's embedded in the auction process that really cause buyers in this scenario to do things rooted in emotion rather than rooted in sanity or rational judgment, let's say. So all of those things in theory would benefit the seller, right? Because if it's, if the goal for the seller was purely to extract maximum, let's say valuation on the transaction itself, then, you know, you would, you would probably say, sure. That might be a nice path then. Exactly. Load up all these psychological things into the process that are in my favor. And let's just try to get the highest price. And that's what's going to, you know, sold, you know, it's going <laughs> to, that's, that's, 
That's the auction, okay? Well, and keep in mind too, like part of like the the deadlines and the the frenzy that comes with it oftentimes is before a lot of one-on-one dialogue between buyer and seller because it is such a vast pool that the banker is going out to. There simply isn't enough time to have a lot of dedicated one-on-one time during this. So you're kind of one can feel like they're bidding against themselves as you go through round and round because they don't have that conviction about the fit yet. There hasn't been enough time really spent to understand more than just the initial valuation. Well, of course, you're you're okay. So this is a thing that I mean, it's not this is not an hilarious thing. This is anybody ask any buyer or any seller. What's the most important thing to get right in the transaction? What what would they say? What would be a common answer from either perspective? Cultural fit. Cultural fit. That's right. That's what they're both going to say, however they express it, and by whatever they mean by that, they're going to say what, what they what they mean by that. Jacqueline is typically they want the best. <clears throat> what's the best deal? Truly, if culture is the most important thing, and when we say we got to get the cultural fit right, I, I assure you they don't mean. And sacrifice valuation as a result. That's not, that's not what they mean at all. They're just saying that if I'm if I'm putting things in order of priority, what's most important? Price is certainly going to be in the top of that list. But they're not willing to sacrifice culture for them, for their team, and for their clients at the expense of another turn of the mold. You know that that's what they mean. We got to get culture right first and foremost. As you mentioned, buyers don't want to have someone in their family that just dis- it's disruptive. <clears throat> Sellers want to know that they're doing right by them, their team, and their clients. So we've got to get the culture right, and we're, we'll talk maybe a little bit about that. But let's talk about what the auction process looks like. You know, how does it? How is an auction typically ran? And I'm going to shorten this, but this is basically how it goes. So you hire a sell side advisor. The first order of business is they're going to run you through some educational meetings, probably just to educate you on the market and so forth. Uh, and then they're going to be collecting and organizing your data, right? So it's it's qualitative and quantitative data. So there's the qualitative data, which is, you know, what are your partnership preferences? You know, what are you seeking? And ideally, there, there'll be a bit of that. But the emphasis is going to be on the quantitative data, your PL, client segmentation, your operations, your staffing, all the stuff that is the reality of your current situation. So there's a data organization. They're going to get all this and they're going to organize it in a way that a buyer would want to see it. And they're going to build commonly what's called a SIM deck, a confidential information memorandum. We've seen them over and over. They're basically PowerPoint presentations, 10 to 20, 30 slides of who you are, what you're seeking, high level financials, high level review of your staff, you know, a few points on your clients and things like that, your client experience. And what they do is they send an email blast out to a ton of buyers, 40, 50, 70 buyers, right? And they're they're just casting this blind net with no knowledge or inference on anything remotely cultural. It's just they're sending this email out and they're asking for who's interested, who's interested to participate in the process. The buyers that are raise their hand and they're asked to sign a confidentiality agreement. So let's say 40 buyers sign a confidentiality agreement. They're now in the process. So the first thing that the sell side advisor is going to do is after they sign the confidentiality agreement is send them the send deck, you know, which is a deeper dive into the business, as I just articulated. And they're going to ask them to put forth what's called an indication of interest, which is basically an offer. <clears throat> it's a high level offer. You haven't really been given any of the source data as a buyer. You haven't been getting any of the source data that supports the information with send deck. You might be given a half hour if, if that to spend, or maybe an hour, you know, to spend with a seller on the phone, very rarely in the first round though, but you know, it's like put forth an offer. So all the buyers put forth their offer and the sell side advisor takes those offers, analyze them, and they start to advance you through the buyers through this series, they call them rounds where, you know, some offers may be just immediately rejected. Others are advanced to the next round and they'll just do this over again. They'll ask the buyers to sharpen their pencil increase their offer, change these deal terms. And they just keep going through these series of rounds, again, with very little interaction between the buyer and seller. In fact, what we've seen in a lot of cases, they'll sell side advisor acts as sort of a gatekeeper between the two parties. Because practically speaking, 
be very hard to schedule 30 meetings. Yeah, sellers trying to run a business too in the midst of all of this. Math is the focal screening mechanism to advance or eliminate buyers, let's say. You know, it's the insufficiency of their financial offer period that is eliminating buyers who have had no time to get to know you or determine if you're a cultural fit, right? And so, and this process is used over and over again in the wealth management business between two parties who cite the cultural aspect as the most important thing. The financial auction ignores it like entire. You get it down to a handful of buyers in the who make it to the final round, and then maybe you'll be able to spend some quality time. And so, you know, we just ask ourselves, is that the preferred route? And does it indeed produce a maximum valuation? You know, I've never seen a report, have you, where there's data that says that this process actually produces the maximum valuation? I've never seen one. I think there's like a common sense part of it, though, that the that you're willing to pay more for something if you're you're sure that it's a great fit, that you have a good connection, you, you know, that certain all the points of alignment boxes are being checked. Well, I agree with that, but that's not what the financial auction is doing. You know, you're there's no even reference to the points of alignment. But I, I love where you went with that. I, it, it, I like what you said. Common sense. So I'll give you an example. And this is not directly attributable to a wealth management business, but the theory holds, I think. So my wife and I are building a new house. We're shopping for an oven, okay? And I know the oven that I, I love cooking, so like I'm a foodie, and, and, and so I'm going to spend a lot of money on this oven. And uh, so it's very pricey. We live in South Florida, and there was an auction where this mansion on the beach, this rich dude wants to tear the existing mansion down and build another one on it and in the existing house is the oven that I want, the very oven that I want, okay? And so we're online and this, up, you know, they list a price like a starting bid and a range that they expect it to sell for. And it's easily less than 50% than what I would expect to pay uh, at retail. For a brand new retail, yeah. And all, all that's on the website is a picture of the oven. And then you have a description of it it looks pretty good, you know, it looks, looks new in fact. And, but you know, I'm skeptic. I, I don't, I don't know that that's the actual oven. Is it a picture they just took off a website? Does it work? Is it rusty? Is it corroded? You know, all these things I don't know. So my wife and I agree on like, what's the maximum price that we would offer in the auction. And it's probably like 75% of what they're saying in the range. And it's rooted in that I don't have a conviction over the oven. Like, it's just like, it's, it's going to be a good deal, but I don't want to risk money that that I'm not sure that the outcome I'm, uh, that I'm looking at is going to be um, delivered. Anyway, so my wife is a socialite, and so she made friends with the auctioneer. She called them and started befriending them, and they said, would you like to go see the house? And we're like high-fiving each other. We're like, heck yeah, I want to go see the house, right? Like, So it's only 20 minutes for us. We jump in the car, go down there, uh, inspect the house, look at the oven. It's brand new. The guy never cooked in it. Like It's like there's nothing wrong with it. We turn the, the burners on. Everything works great. The point is, pair that to like exploring culture, you know, like, so I went, I saw it, I laid eyes on it. I got to spend time with it. I determined that. Th and so now my willingness to pay more, we almost doubles doubled, you know, because of my conviction that it was actually a great thing for me to buy. Same kind of concept we're talking about here. Rather than this blind auction where buyers and sellers are prevented from spending time together when they're, the buyers are being asked to increase their offer, bidding against themselves, essentially. Um, you know, will that produce a higher outcome, a better economic offer than a buyer who falls in love with you? Now, I wonder if like the counterpoint is that you advance through pricing and then we'll get the cultural fit right from the ones that surface to the top three. Like that must be the counter counter position there. That's the counter position, but you, I've seen, you've seen this too, where buyers, they have an initial offer, right? And then because of the way we run our process, we actually encourage them to spend time. In fact, it's kind of mandatory that they, we, they go through a series of meetings entirely designed to have them spend time with one another so that each party can really try to get a, the subjective feel 
of whether they're going to be happy, you know, on the other side of the transaction. We've seen that occur and the buyer come back without prompting, without prompting and in radically increase their offer. So the, the punchline is if you're a buyers aren't in a financial auction, aren't making, not putting their best foot forward early, typically. And so you run the risk in that process of eliminating really good partners who would have paid a much higher price had they gotten the opportunity to spend time with you and develop that level of conviction. Okay. So I think like, I feel really good about defending this proposition that financial auctions are improper about, you know, for the wealth management industry, if you're selling a piece of real estate or a car or a watch, great. There's no post acquisition ramifications to anybody really other than the buyer. In the wealth management, as we've established, there's post acquisition ramifications for all the stakeholders involved. And so is there a better process? And so uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Like, so we run a very different process, um, called a cultural competition or, or conviction competition, wherein we have spent years cataloging buyer models at a granular level. And, and, and in the back of my mind, this makes me think like, why, why if auctions, if I'm right, and auctions are not the proper mechanism to match buyers and sellers in wealth management, why is it used? And the only thing that I can come up with is that's the only thing the sell side advisors have. Yeah, there isn't an expectation placed by sellers, I guess, would be the ones to, to focus on it, to say, why do we need to go to 70? Like, how do you feel like these 70 potential buyers would be a great fit for me? And like, can you articulate why each one of those would be? And there's no way. It's like well, it's a wide net because you can't. Yeah, they're, they're not bad people. None of these firms that we compete with, we know them. They're great people. But the, if, you know, me being critical, they don't know much beyond the deal mash of the buyer models. Like I, they can tell you how firm XYZ is likely to price a firm and structure it. It can't tell you anything about their client experience, their tech stack, their growth profile, you know, what their practice management capabilities, how they expand your services. They can't tell you any of that stuff. So the reason we can do that is we've taken years to catalog the buyer model. So when we on, when we, as a sell side advisor, we represent the seller, it doesn't mean we can't spend time with the buyers. You know, and so we actually engage the buyers proactively. We call it being on our roster where they sign an agreement and they agree to spend the requisite time with us for us to understand their model at a granular level. Probably easily 30 hours, if not more, of onboarding time with each buyer where they're completing an exhaustive data set of information about everything from their history, their organizational chart, their acquisition history, their capital partners, you know, their equity story, uh, everything that I just mentioned, their, you know, their advisor proposition, their client experience, their investment platform, their tech, everything. Right. Deal terms are such a minor part of what we're gathering on every single buyer. Yeah. Well, a fraction of the data set that we collect. And so to your point, are there really 70 buyers out there that are great? For no, no, there's not. And so we think the better approach if you do have the information on the buyers, which we do, we can then, after taking the seller through that standard initial process of education, organizing and structuring their data in the way that the buyer wants to see it, we, we have a basic called a list of all of the points of alignment, which would include the business reality of the seller, their partnership preferences, you know, what are they seeking, not only financially, but in their quality of life and, you know, all the other things that they would be looking for in a, in a partnership post acquisition. We know that on the buyers already, you know, we know what their points of alignment are, everything that they're going to require, who they're not looking for. Right. And so we can run a, a conviction screen, let's say, where we know the points of alignment of the seller. We know the points of alignment of the buyer and we can match them together. And because we have that data, when we bring the seller through that process and we get to the buyer identification and mashing, rather than cast this blind net, asking parties who shouldn't be invited to the table, frankly, we can tell you, okay, these are the buyers. Here's the top 10 buyers that you need to focus on. And here's why, because they are a fit for you on every point of alignment you're seeking, you know, maybe 
eight out of 10, nine out of 10, you know, but, but we can tell you the strength of the match. Now that's not a cultural assessment because culture takes time. You, you can't score or measure culture. You know, it's, it's collective personality. It's just, it's a vibe you get. And so you, you can't measure that, but what we can do is increase the quality of buyers at the table, reduce the amount of buyers. So reduce this, the number of buyers, but much higher quality such that the seller from day one gets to spend time with them, you know? And so we know that everyone that we invite from a buyer perspective, it's a take from the seller's wish list. It's a take from the buyer's, you know, requirements. And now we can focus on what's really important. Do we like each other? You know, can I see our, can we see ourselves working together? Those are the things that can only come through time. So rather than run this blind financial auction, where as the advisor, we're preventing the parties from interacting. We actually encourage it. In fact, demand that they interact with one another. And, you know, unlike the blind auction where the difference between the top firm and the, let's say the top 10 or 20 is vast in our outcome. It's like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. They're extremely close to one another, not only in terms of fit, but in terms of economic offers. And, you know, by the way, when we're considering the economic offer, we're not just talking about the initial valuation. We're talking about the initial valuation, the post-acquisition earnout, and the post-acquisition sharing of economics and the equity story. We have all of that data, so we can incorporate that into evaluation of the deal. But I think that's, you know, if you run that cultural auction, not only like auction, um, but cultural conviction to where both parties are coming into it, knowing that they're already a fit, they're, they're a take on the foundational elements of what's important to them, that, that produces a much higher probability that regardless of who they transact with, post-acquisition, the both parties are gonna be happy. You know, it definitely produces that. I think it produces a higher valuation because the buyers are falling in love with the seller based on conviction, not this financial auction rooted in all these psychological biases that are meant to cause them to do irrational things, you know? So, um, but you have to have the buyer data. And that's why we're, we're sort of coming out now making this statement that the legacy process of financial auctions is outdated. It's like taxis and the cultural conviction process is Uber. <laughs> it's like, it's just a much better way to go about doing this. And I will tell you this, the dirty little secret, buyers hate the current auction process as it is. You know, they, they are reluctant to come out and say it because they're the only game in town or been the only game in town, so to speak. But we get them behind the scenes all the time and they can't stand the, that financial auction process. They can't believe that we're willing to invest the time to get to know them and actually care about their outcome on the other side, you know? So... I think personally, you know, we're, I, we're leading the charge here, but I think it's going to, it's going to cause the entire industry to pivot and really rethink the process that they're using to match buyers and sellers. And the sell side advisors are going to have to pay attention to the buyer needs and the buyer outcome and, and care about it. You know, not that they're not representing the seller and seeking their best outcome as their representative, but nothing wrong with actually caring about the buyer perspective here as well. Right. Yeah. Being well-versed in, in all the things that matter to all the different stakeholders. And and hopefully that is the future of the model. You know, I'm biased, obviously, to say it, but I don't see how it's not. You know, I've thought this through and I, I don't know the argument against, you know, this process or this mechanism versus that auction process, which frankly, in, in my view, sucks. So, uh, but heck, what do I know? Well, perfect. Well, I think I think that covers it. No guests today, but would love to hear anyone's reactions to that. Boardroom at alarisacquisitions.com. And that's a wrap for today. We'll see you soon, Alan. Thank you, Jacqueline. Cheers.